as it happened today, I was meeting with um, Ian Hunter, um, who's the Minister for Environment and supposedly for Heritage, and um, we, were, we were talking to him about this whole thing about heritage tourism. And it's interesting to see that the government seems to have discovered this idea that heritage is good for tourism. And they were quoting back to us some ideas about, yeah, you know, the half. Well, it's, that's right, we were telling them last year, but now they, they've heard it, and it's like they, they was telling us that, did we know that half of the international visitors to South Australia visited heritage places? How about that? We knew that, and we've been trying to get that message across for a while. So what, what I'm going to talk about um, tonight is really how to think about heritage as a tourism asset, and how to look at the ways in which we need to present heritage and history um, as a way to engage new generations and you know, international visitors. Okay, um, does anyone know who this lady is? It's a bit of a trick question, really. Um, she's kind of having a birthday this year. Um, she's um, Octavia Hill, and she's one of the founding members of the National Trust in the UK, which was established 120 years ago this year in 1895. And so Octavia Hill is a really interesting woman, and she was one of the driving forces behind the establishment of that body in the UK. We were only a little bit behind. In South Australia, we established our National Trust 60 years later in 1955. I don't know if you can read that, but if you look at the left side, you can see the original purpose of the National Trust in the UK was for promoting the permanent preservation for the benefit of the nation of lands and tenements of beauty or historic interest, um, as well as their natural aspect features in animal and plant life. So that's, that was how they got the National Trust started in the UK. On the right-hand side is what we did when we established the National Trust of South Australia in 1955. And if you can read them, they're very similar. So we really took the blueprint of the National Trust in the UK to start the National Trust in South Australia. Interestingly, they're 120 this year and we're 60 years old this year. So in that time in South Australia, um, we've managed to um, accrue 126 properties, um, 24 museums, 45 local area branches across the state, and about 5,700 members. And Marilyn would know all about this from her time on the Council at the Trust. So it's become a pretty big organisation across South Australia and spread far and wide. Um, I was over at Sejuna on the weekend, which is that flag over on the far left there. And uh, yeah, they're going strong over there in Sejuna. So, um, it shows, I suppose, that the enduring appeal of the kind of principles that Octavia Hill was, was on about, what we copied, if you like, when we established the National Trust in South Australia. And um, it's still you know, going strong today. So it's great to see how enduring, if you like, people's commitment is to the idea of preserving, celebrating um, heritage and history. Another trick question. Um, does anyone know what this building is? You can't say Marilyn, you're not allowed to, or you, David. Anybody else? Think mad. <laughs> Think really mad. Look at the mad bricks. That should give you a clue. Crazy painting. Yes, crazy painting. <laughs> uh, this is um, Z Ward at Glenside in Adelaide. And um, we've had a really interesting time there the last, the last year. Uh, in November last year, we opened Z Ward to the public. It was the first time in 40 years that anyone had been, any public member of the public had been inside the building. Now, Z Ward is really interesting, A, because it's very interesting architecturally. You can see the building behind the wall there, and the wall itself is quite interesting. It's what's called a ha ha wall because it's much deeper on the inside than on the outside. So, when you're on the inside, there's no way you can get over it. But on the outside, it looks like just a, a reasonably high wall. And the Ha Ha Wall was a great feature of, of psychiatric institutions in the 19th century. They kind of built them to be a little bit discreet. Like, we don't really want people to know that this is what we're doing here. And um, so the Ha Ha Wall was a very distinctive part of that architecture. And this is the last intact Ha Ha Wall in Australia. So we're very concerned that this, is, that this place got preserved. And we were staggered how many people were so interested to come and see it when we actually um, opened Z Board. As you can see here from the crowd, they snaked around for about a kilometre and then up to Green Hill Road the first day we opened it. We were just overwhelmed by about 5,000 people showed up to see it. So this, once again, shows the interest 
people have in heritage places, that people are fascinated by these places for all kinds of reasons too. You know, we had, I think, I've never seen so many people with tattoos and piercings in my life as on these days, we had these open days. So it's attracting a really different crowd. It's not your usual heritage crowd. But they were there and they loved it. And then after we did these open days, we started doing night tours. And so they were incredibly popular as well. Over summer, um, we had about um, 3,000 people through on night tours, where you come there at night and really get the bejesus scared out of you, because it's, it is a creepy place. Um, it's not that comfortable with the daytime, and at night time, it's really uncomfortable. But people love it. And they, they lapped it up and they would, would come. We couldn't, we couldn't get enough people through. So um, at the end of January, though, the, co the, company, the government sold this building last year. We campaigned against the sale of this building. It was a publicly owned heritage building. Nonetheless, the government sold it, and they sold it to Beach Energy. And um, Beach had plans to turn this into an office, this building into office space. And that was what they were going to do with it. Um, but fortunately for us, maybe not for them, um, their um, calculations of how much it's going to cost to do that um, have made them think twice about whether they want to do that. And so they said to us, well, would you like to come back and run the building as a heritage attraction? And we said, sure, we'll give that a go. Um, so we're actually about to open next week again for a year, Z Ward as a heritage attraction with day tours, night tours, art events, would you believe, um, performance and all kinds of things. So hopefully over the next year you might get a chance to experience Z Ward. It's a pretty amazing place, but it shows, once again, that heritage is endlessly fascinating. And we think it's possibly South Australia's newest tourist attraction. A lot of raw material in South Australia, that's for sure. Oh, madness or architecture? Yeah. Madness. Oh, okay. oh, yeah. Well, it's interesting because in Victoria, the two big old asylums there, Beechworth and um, Ararat, are hugely popular tourist attractions because people are fascinated by murder and madness and all those kind of other crazy things. Um, so look, we, we always try to remember what we're here for and heritage is really the legacy of the past we preserve for the future. So we're always thinking about well, what are we keeping and why are we keeping it, who are we keeping it for? Um, so heritage tourism is this idea that people travel to places to experience um, places, artifacts and activities that authentically represent the stories and people of the past. So this is really what drives heritage tourism. If you ever think about your trip to Europe or if you've been to South America to see the Aztecs or uh, other places of North America, you go and see you know, um, colonial culture or whatever, um, really what we're going for is to experience um, these things which authentically represent the stories of people of the past. So it's really how we keep those stories alive. It's not just about the fabric of the buildings, it's about what those stories are. Um, and tourism really began with the, the, the European tour, the grand tour of Europe. And so this is a painting from the 1830s of people doing their grand tour in, in Europe. And so really tourism is always very much been tied up with heritage. Okay. As the Minister was telling us today, half the, half the international tourists to Australia visit heritage <coughs> places. Um, and 11.5 million domestic day trips include heritage cultural visits. But what's really interesting is that heritage tourists uh, spend 38% more per day and stay 34% longer than other tourists. They either have lots of time and money or they're just um, really in into doing heritage when they're doing a tourism activity. So um, often um, government will confuse the arts with heritage. And we try to separate that because people might come to play for the festival but actually people who come for heritage actually stay longer and spend more than just arts tourists as well. So we know heritage brings tourism in. Strangely enough though, in the state's tourism strategy, there's no mention of heritage. There wasn't, anyway. Um, the last tourism strategy that came out last year, they didn't mention heritage. And we said, hang on, it's like, don't you understand all those things? But it's good to hear today that the message may be getting through. Um, and heritage is really about these kind of values, really about authenticity, about quality, integrity, 
uniqueness, irreplaceable, telling stories, community and identity. All the things you are doing authentically with your work are really trying to make sure that those stories are captured, preserved and circulated. But in South Australia we have fantastic heritage assets. Um, like some of these brands, like um, Penfolds, like Range, um, maybe Beer, it was almost a local, was she? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, Coopers, Handorf itself is a big heritage brand, um, Berenberg, Hagues, and then Tandania, you know, is a fantastic heritage asset that we have. So we've got incredible heritage assets there, but what are we doing to promote them? Um, we have built natural and cultural and good destinations and experience. And once again, it's looking at how do these, if you like, destinations and experiences produce authentic quality stories and experiences that people can have. Um, who's been to Annalaby Station? Yes, okay. Annalaby is an amazing property. It's really got an amazing story. The garden is incredible. It has... Trees are incredible. The trees are incredible. The trees alone in, in Annalaby, they have 600 trees on our register of significant trees. They have more significant trees at one property than any other place in the country. So it's really amazing if you're into trees, but it's a great story in terms of what they're doing now to restore that place as well. We also have some amazing trees, you know, in the, in the wild, if you like. Um, has noticed trees and one of the most photographed um, trees probably in the state. Um, very famous um, as one of those, if you like, hyson-like gums. But we also have, you know, the, the food culture of somewhere like Handorf, where you have all of these very meaty German things that you can have, which is really part of the culture. And I'm always staggered when I go to Handorf how many Chinese people there are there. There's more Chinese people there than anything else, lapping up German culture, which is all kind of a bit strange. But. Uh, then we have, you know, our wine, wine, wine culture as well. So, you know, we have all these assets. Uh, wine is in the news right now. Um, yesterday the government announced um, an unsolicited bid to turn Martindale Hall into a, a wellness resort. So we are, are interested in that, that idea, but um, we're in discussion, I suppose, about how that's going to turn out. So there's a, actually a meeting in, um, at Martindale Hall on the 18th of August, if you want to go up and share your views about what should happen to Martindale Hall. But once again, this is a great asset that hasn't been worked properly at all. It's sat there, you know, pretty obscure for about 20 years since government took it over and it really hasn't been turned into the kind of attraction it could be. And then, you know, in the city we have these kind of buildings sitting empty in most cases on, say, on North Terrace, these lovely um, buildings designed by E.J. Woods. Um, same architecture design Z board, by the way. Um, yeah, who, and and Mandal, he was involved in that too, wasn't he? He was everywhere there, man. He's just amazing. Yeah. And the post office and the town hall and yeah. So um, actually for the Festival of Architecture and Design in October we're doing a tour to the city of his sites and then an afternoon tour at Z Ward. Um, but yeah, these kind of buildings, they're just sitting there. And in other parts of the world, these places would be, you know, a hive of activity. People would be living in them, there'd be all kinds of things going on. So what are we doing wrong? You know, we have all this great stuff and we're not actually making it, you know, do what it could do. Um, so there's many ways that Heritage provides value for um, businesses and tourists. So it creates a great space for people to enjoy, a, you know, a wine experience. Um, it gives them things to do, like a scenic drive. You know, this is a, in Clare Valley, wine and, wine and heritage scenic drive. If you're into Instagram, it gives you something that you can use as a backdrop for your Instagram posting. If you're a Japanese tourist in Handorf, <laughs> you can share your food on Instagram as well. This food porn, food porn. yeah, that's very awful food. <laughs> um, or you could actually you can actually use heritage to enhance the the tourism experience. So Orchard House, Maggie Beer, you know, it's a lovely old house combined with the great food creates a really irresistible experience. You can, you know, bring famous people over to promote um, your brand and, uh, you know, use that to, you know, if you like, raise the profile of your product. 
So, uh, the question really is, where is Heritage in South Australia's tourism strategy? As I said, missing in action. Um, but apparently, the government is now looking at a heritage tourism strategy. So, not before time, because West Australia and Victoria already have had them for about a decade. So, we're just catching up. No wonder our tourism numbers are going down rather than going up. <coughs> So, you know, where is the investment in these kind of places? Now, this proposal for Martindale Hall, you know, there is some money obviously involved in doing what they're doing. Whether that's the right outcome for Martindale Hall, I'm not sure about yet. But, um, but the idea, we do have to invest in these places to make them real tourism attractions. Um, in the city, you may know this building on King William Street called Electra House. After being empty for 20 years, it's now been converted into a bar and restaurants. And if you've been there, it's really lovely inside. I've done a great job with the conversion. So it's really interesting. Some of the most interesting kind of eating places in the city of Adelaide now have been created in the last few years, like um, Jamie's Place and um, to, um, the Mayfair Hotel, Electra House. It's all in heritage buildings. And this is this whole thing. It's like, it's not just we've got new bars and restaurants. We've got new bars and restaurants in great heritage places, and that's really what sells. So um, this is the, the Mayfair Hotel. I don't know if you ever have a chance to go up to the bar at the top. It's a very nice place to have a drink. And then we have we have these kind of events too, like you know, um, Handorf is always having these kind of events. And really, they can only do that because of the heritage there. You can't just kind of create these kind of parade when you don't have the heritage to back it up. So heritage is kind of in the background everywhere in terms of our tourism industry, but we don't give it enough, enough credit, we don't support it enough, we don't invest in it enough. Um, but, you know, the National Trust is there trying, trying to do what we can do um, to keep um, heritage alive and to keep people in our heritage places. Now we, without government money, manage 120 places across the state including Ayers House on North Terrace. I'm sure you've all been to Ayers House. Um, Colin Grove at Angerston. I'm sure you all know Colin Grove. Um, places like Borough. Um, I'm sure everyone's been to Borough, I imagine. Yep. Uh, Cape Jaffa Lighthouse. Who knows that down in Kingston? Um, I'm pleased to say, too, we're just about to announce a major conservation project at Cape Jaffa. We're going to um, fix, replace all the bolts in the lighthouse and repaint the whole thing before it fell down. Um, so that's another major project and we're doing that with um, some fundraising we've been doing. So, um, yeah, the National Trust is out there all over the state doing these kind of things to keep the heritage viable and interesting. And then we have natural heritage places like Willa Balangaloo up near Berry. People know that place. It's very beautiful um, ochre cliffs on the Murray. <coughs> The Muta Tourist Railway. Yeah. Evans nodding, that's good. You've done that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, we're trying to create all these experiences and make them available to people, but what we've also discovered is we need new ways to make these things available. So, we've been investing in um, these kind of digital projects like um, Adelaide City Explorer, is a mobile app. Um, which we say is about find your Adelaide. So it really gives you the chance using a, a phone or a tablet to navigate the heritage places in the city. And uh, we've got about 140 different places in there and they're organised into what we call walking trails. So you can go and do a, a themed trail. For example, we've got one called the City of Pubs. So you can go and do a walk or a stagger around 14 heritage pubs in the city. And we've got another one called um, uh, Mary McKillop's Adelaide, so you can do something a bit more kind of uplifting and follow in the steps of Mary McKillop, you know, going to the place where she was excommunicated and seeing, you know, it's quite powerful when you go there and, you know, think about what happened to her there. So, giving people different ways to experience the heritage of the city as well. And um, we also did another trail about the Summerton Man case. Do you remember, remember, do you know about the case of the Summerton Man? There's a lot of places in the city that relate to the case, from the morgue at the RAH that the body came into, um, to the, the railway station where we know he arrived, to his actual um, burial site in West Terrace Cemetery. So what we've done is put a trail together where you can visit those sites and try and piece together your own theory about what happened with the Summerton man. 
So there's lots of fun ways now we can give people access to information about heritage and help them navigate their own way around the city to enjoy it. And we've just partnered with Google on that. So Google are going to put all of our stuff from Adelaide City Explorer in their tourism app called um, Google Field Trip, which means millions of people will get all that stuff in their hands as soon as they um, get to Adelaide. So that means we've got lots of ways now of um, helping people to discover heritage and get out there and enjoy it. Brian mentioned Wollonga. Um, the Now and Then project we did here, um, we also did a Now and Then wiki in Wollonga. And what we've done since then is a project called Wollonga Walks. Um, and what it is, it's um, a wiki site, just like yours, um, exactly like yours, back. Um, but what we've done is, on top of that, we've done um, a series of plaques on buildings which have QR codes on them. So what happens, you know, your traditional kind of heritage plaque might just say local heritage place or it might have 50 words. So what these plaques do is they have this little QR code which you can scan with a phone or a, a tablet and what that does is gives you access to all that information in the palm of your hand about that place. So you can have, you know, um, people talking about the place, you can have photographs, you can have audio, all those things that you can't fit on a plaque normally. So what we're doing, we're calling these digital plaques. So there's about a dozen of these around Wollonga now, and they're connected up to their now and then wiki. So when you scan that code, um, it'll take you to, to the relevant page in your wiki. So that's, so that's what we've done at Wollonga, but as well as that, we did a, a mobile app for Wollonga Walks. So that's another way to give people information. <coughs> so who uses um, a mobile phone? Okay. Who uses a smartphone? Okay. Who uses apps? Oh, okay, I've got a few app users. Excellent. Okay, right. So now I'm talking about, I'm talking about apps. <coughs> Because really, you know, like the, the smartphone is, you know, the, the offspring of the mobile phone and the, and the computer. So basically, once they came together, you've got a smartphone. And smartphones are really amazing. That's what they can do. Smartphones. So, so the thing about apps is that they don't they don't sit on the internet. They're actually on your mobile device. So. I'll just try and get that line on the iPad. Is that going to work here? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so basically what we've got in um, Melinda Walks is two... Microphone, thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay. <coughs> okay. So what we have um, with Wollonga Walks is a way of connecting up all those places. Uh, so, um, so what we have here is um, the starting point for a lot of our walks is the courthouse and police station, um, which the National Trust runs. And so what you can do here is put images. So you can have a series of images. Um, this is just the, the paving in the... Uh, the courtyard, uh, another picture of the stables. So for each of these stops on the walk you can have as many photographs as you like, um, but you can also have, you won't be able to hear this very well, but not. Parts house the police, land surveyors and the post office. The government reserve was an important site for the developing settlement. It was a temporary resting place for new immigrants, a supply depot for government officials, and provided accommodation for displaced Aboriginal people. Across the creek, on the hill. You get the, you get the idea. So, so basically, what we've got here then is you can go to the next stop. So and that's um, a cottage, and once again, you can see some historic photographs um, of the people who live there, and um, a more contemporary shot of the house. 
Um, so, what, so what we've got here in this case, we've got about um, 25 stops you can see on a map. So you can um, either follow the route in terms of following the numbers, this goes 1 to 27 I think, um, or you can just say, oh well I'm over here, what's, what's at 13? So you can pick out a house and you know, just go there and look at that one if you like. <laughs> So what this does is provides a new way for people to discover all the information we know about these places. And you in Gawla have the most amazing amount of information on all those photographs that Paul has taken of all your local heritage places. Is Paul here? Mm. Oh, there he is. Hello, Paul. Um, yeah, so, so you've really got all this information. And the hard part really with Wollonga Wolf is working out how to do it and checking all the information to make sure it's accurate because sometimes um, errors creep in. They had a booklet they produced called Wollonga Walks, so they produced in 1989. And when we went back to it, we discovered some of it was a bit inaccurate and we needed to fix it up. But um, So it's all been fact-checked again. And now we have the Now and Then Wiki, the signs, the plaques, and the app. So uh, we have a really rich way now to give people a chance to explore Wollonga. And so we've been talking about this to a number of other other towns, and um, we did try and get Gawler, the town of Gawler, involved in this last year. But despite Brian's best efforts, um, it didn't go anywhere with the town of Gawler uh, yet. 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 Um, but we're talking yes. to um, uh, Victor Harbour and Auburn about doing this as well. And so what we want to do is really kind of um, build up, if you like, um, an itinerary of heritage places across the state so we can put them all in a single app. So if you come to South Australia and say, okay, well, I'm going to go to Victor Harbour this weekend, I'm going to do these trails, and you can tie it in with businesses as well. So what you could do is say, in some cases, a lot of these heritage places are now... Um, let me see, I think... This one? No, and now either cafes or B and B's. Um, I don't think that one is. But what you can do is say, okay, if you if you come in with your app to say this is a cafe, you can get a discount on your coffee. So you can kind of promote local businesses as well. Uh, so there's lots of ways in which we can make this. Um, uh, a way to build tourism, to give people a chance to stop and spend money as well. Um, then the pubs are kind of interested in looking at how they can they can be involved in discounting meals and things like that as well. So um, there's a lot of ways you can kind of leverage it once you've actually got the infrastructure in place. So um, we think this is a pretty good way to kind of make all that great information and your know, photographs and oral histories, all those things, readily accessible for people um, so they can, they can take it away with them because we know now that most people over 40, over 40, under 40, um, live through their phones. That that's where they get information. Is that true, Nicole? <laughs> <laughs> well, that should, well, that should be a spokesperson for a generation. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, like if you just look around, it's amazed how how attached people are to their phones. That that if you want to make this stuff available, if you want to actually reveal, if you like, the stories of Gawla, to people, you've got to be make it available through these these devices. Um, people are not going to read books, um, sadly. Um, they're going to read things on their smartphone or their tablets, um, and they'll share them. So really, that's what we think should be behind a heritage tourism strategy for South Australia. That really needs to not just be using all those assets, but actually needs to be using the technologies of um, contemporary life to make sure that heritage is relevant, accessible, and interesting. So hopefully we'll see a heritage tourism strategy for South Australia, but um, we can only encourage the government. What's that? It's remarkable. They have been totally blind for about 20 years or maybe more. It's, it, it's, it, it is just rule from blindness. Deliberate stuff. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, it may be coming, but um, we're, we're well behind the other states with this. So um, we need to really bring our, if you like, our, our heritage places, our heritage brands, and our knowledge of history and culture together into this really exciting heritage offer we can make to people. So that's my talk. Um, hopefully that's given you a few ideas. Happy to answer questions or whatever on the floor. Good on. Thanks.
Paul. Yeah, just a comment. I've done an entry to overseas. The only downside we found in the group is that a lot of buildings are not open. Um, and the only downside we found is that a lot of buildings are not open. Yeah. So it's nice that you walk your cups. It's a lovely building. Yep. And you go, I'll go in and have a look and you can't go in. Yes. Once you can go in off to the clubs or cups, and we do the going to the dining room. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think the good thing with this is um, you could give people a virtual tour of inside. Like, you could actually put that in the app so that if they can't go in at a particular time, they could actually see inside. You could have some photographs inside as well. So, you know, it does, in a way, give you a way to compensate for the fact that they may not be open. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, we've talked about that with the people at Wollonga. We've now actually got people in Wollonga saying, can we be on this now? Can we be on this now? Can we have a plaque? So, you know, um, that's good because people are realising that if they're running a business like a B&B, &B, that this is a really good thing to be on this um, Wollonga Walks. Um, look, the, the cost to produce them is about $120. Um, what about the, the barrier put up by the local oh, yes. council? Oh, okay, that's right. Yeah, well, see, this, this project was a pilot to try and test this kind of proof of concept that we had, this idea we could do this. But the biggest obstacle was the planners at the city of Onkaparinga who had all these rules about signs. So, to put up a sign, a sign like this, which as I said, cost us about, you know, the materials cost about 120 to produce it, they wanted to charge us $400 in terms of administered fees to get permission to put the sign up. Not from the building owner. Per sign. Per sign. Per sign. Not from the building owner, but from the council. From the council, that's yeah. right, yes. So it's a fee gathering. <laughs> that's that's right. <laughs> so we had six months backwards and forwards with the council on whether we could put these signs up, where they could go, and how many development. We had to put in a development application for a sign like for this. Every sign. For every sign, that's right. Until fortunately the mayor intervened, uh, Lorraine Rosenberg, and got a few concessions for us. But there are still buildings we didn't put plaques on because of that, because they were going to make us pay a ridiculous amount of money. So it's, it's not actually, the technology is not the hard part. Sometimes it's to, it's to bureaucracy that's the problem, yeah. Well, Oh, you got a question. Darren, I'm curious. Uh, we have those plaques already existing on, on our very auspicious buildings here. Yeah. Would, would there be a possibility, I suppose, with council being involved and with the Gawler Heritage Group and yeah. as, as well with the National Trust, could, there, could you do a post like the plaques exist to yes. utilise that plaque space? That's right. You don't need to create new plaques necessarily. That's true. What, what we've done in, in Adelaide, we've got, for Adelaide City Explorer, we've got stick-on um, QR codes. So you can just make them up as stickers, and they can be, they can, you can change them over. So you can put them up for a week and change them. So it doesn't have to be that permanent at all. So you could whack a sticker on. So we're talking about at Auburn, because they've got plaques already in Auburn. Uh, just adding a sticker, which gives you the QR code. So yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. You can do it on the window. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're doing in Adelaide, yeah. Um, so there's an Adelaide City Explorer logo. I didn't bring one, but um, it has the, the QR code where you can find the story. So yeah, it's really easy to do be quite temporary. How soon right. is your history that you're going to do on Port Piri? Is that uh, in some months to come or later? Oh, Port, Port Piri? Um, I, I'm not sure what you mean there. Oh, you mentioned that on the list. Oh, did I? Like no, I mean, right. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, Port Piri. Okay. Right, yeah. Look, uh, we've got a great museum up, up in Port Piri, but I think I think any town can do this. and we. We did, a, we did a workshop with local government last year about heritage and tourism. We talked about some of these ideas and we had a lot of council people come along and I had you know, about four or five of them talk to me afterwards about wanting to do this kind of stuff. But I haven't really heard any more. So, so, so we're working with our local National Trust branches, as I said, at Goolwa and Auburn and Harndorf actually, um, to actually look at doing a similar thing there. And I was at Mount Barker during the week as well and they're interested too. But it takes people a while to get their heads around it I think and you know get organised but we're kind of ready and willing when people want to do it but I would love to do it in Gawler because I think you know we've already got you know such a good kind of basis from what you've done here. Um, it would be quite easy but it would need the council to get on board um, which I think is a bit of a prerequisite for any of these kind of things. So, um, I'm not looking at anyone in particular, Brian, but... As you were saying a little bit earlier about this park, yeah. about having problems with the council, would you have the similar uh, problems with the council that period about the history of the place, like the Mays family that was there? Yeah. I'm sure now it's been levelled. Uh, yeah. And they don't seem to want to identify it, although on, on the uh, uh, website, 
Yeah. Uh, it does stay there. There's a, a listing there. Right. But, uh, Frederick Junior, like Frederick's son, yep. like we call uh, the family here. Yep. Um, him and his brother William, they ran that place for a few years. Right. And they had up to 20 people working there. There's also a mine at uh, uh, Port Germain. Yep. So the money's had business there. Right. Which is just down the road from here. So you can tell all those stories, you know, with one of these things. It's and not it's stories. Like... No, I mean stories as in, as in, you know, historical stories or historical facts. Um, so it's really a matter of, I suppose, what stories do you want to tell? And you can even tell stories about places that don't exist. So you can say, on this site, and you can show photographs of what was there as well. Um, it doesn't even have to be still existing. You can still kind of give people an idea of what was there. And uh, Yeah, so it's, it's incredibly flexible. Yeah. I think sometimes when you talk to people in these uh, areas, they don't know much about it because they're modern people yeah, that, that's, and they don't have knowledge of the before. That, that's right. And this is, this is really our, I suppose, responsibility. I was saying to people at um, Mount Barker, the National Trust there, like it's our responsibility to build the bridge to the digital generation because they won't find us. We've got to find them. So we've got to build these bridges and get all this fantastic knowledge that is around and within groups like this into the spaces that the people of today occupy. Well, I'm doing May's history, like for Frederick and Alfred, his family, yep. from the uh, Cornwall, 1885. Yep. And um, I'm finding trouble finding um, buildings of the May's foundry. Right. Like photos of when he was there. Yep. I was just wondering if here, if there's any descendants of workers of the, uh, of the right. May's foundry. Well, that's a question you could put on your wiki, actually, yeah. and ask people that, you know. Because um, yeah. that, that you'd find within Gawler, people who do have some stuff they can share with you. Yeah. You could also put it in the Sunday Mail, yeah. in that what's your problem thing. Uh, you could even put a letter to the editor of the bunny. Marilyn, you want to comment? Oh, I was just going to say Darren's point about the, uh, what was there before. When we went on the Wulunga Walk, we had photographs of the building as it exists today and its former photographs of it in its former life. Like there were, I think I remember there was an, a shop which had once been a butcher shop and yes. is now something else. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can represent what happened in the past. But what we discovered, and you pointed this out, I think, Marilyn, is that what you need to identify the building first is, now. is a current shop. Yes. yes. What we did in the, in the prototype, that was my yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> it was a really, really valuable one. Because what we, so what we've done now is taken contemporary shots of all the buildings. So, so you have a shop to identify the building, but then you give them the um, historic shops. So the that's right. So because we were, I suppose, thinking like historians, doing the old one first, and actually you need to do it in reverse order and have the new one first, so you can. That's true. And I think, once again, it goes to the limitation of information that our traditional interpretive tools had. So if you think about a plaque like this, it's traditionally had about 50 words. You can't possibly tell that whole story in 50 words. But if you can have a video, if you can have you know, um, audio, um, multiple pictures, you can tell so much more of the how, the what, the where, the why than just the bare facts, the tombstone data. And if we don't do it, no one will because That's right. we'll die out. Exactly. Yeah, and then it will we'll all be silent because all that knowledge is going to disappear unless we, if you like, cross the digital bridge um, to make it available. Uh, just, Dougie? Sorry. Just seeing the, the way effectively we can now flood people with information, 
This brings to mind a conversation I had with a military dude um, some time ago about the difficulty of getting to the soldier in the field the specific information he needs to lob a grenade at the enemy. Confronted by too much information, he have difficulty. So we now have a thing where you go to a town and sort of like you've got a program there sort of selected for you. You can make it so it's you can find components of finding how to simplify it to satisfy various age groups and so forth is actually quite a challenge. I know so, you're onto it, but this is a thing which is quite tricky. And yeah, I reckon we well, well might need to talk to some of our boys in the military about yeah, this, okay. how they do it. Yeah, interesting, yeah. I, I agree. But what we found, we're doing a trail uh, walk in Wollonga for school groups. And we've been through a lot of testing with that to make sure that it works for you know year five students. So they can go around on a walk with their teacher and they can ask questions about well who lived here, why why is this house the way it was, or why was this church here, who who was here at this church. So when, once you start adding that kind of level of curriculum on top too, it becomes interesting in another way. But we're working with the primary school on that. So before we have another question. Now, I'm just wondering, do you see in the future that uh, those barcodes or whatever they're called could somehow link to the Gaul and Now and Then site, creating oh. that link of information? Oh, ab absolutely. Like if you, um, if you if you scan this code here, it goes to a page on Now and Then in Wollonga. Oh. So this this is a plaque for the Elma Hotel in Wollonga, and so that 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 QR code goes straight to the Elma Hotel page on the Now and Then wiki. So yeah. Yeah, if you've got a page on the internet, it doesn't matter what it is, you can make a QR code for that yeah. page. So a QR code just points you, points you to a web page, really. That's, that's simple. Can I, can I do it? You can do it. Let's do a live demonstration. Yeah. Boom! <laughs> okay. There's technology that's going to work This one we had done with Jamie Briggs, the minister, come to launch this. He had never used it. You are scared of a There you go. Well, uh, there you go. Oh, it's have, still. Have live demonstration. Show Paul. Yeah, so um, a revelation for him. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, right. Um, going back to uh, uh, National Trust today, how much pull do you guys have in, uh, in relation to buildings that are being pulled down now? Buildings that have been built in the past, yeah. uh, we have photos of buildings that were around 100 years ago and they don't exist today. Yeah. Well, sadly, not as much as we'd like. Um, the, the reality is the National Trust has no legal powers, so we can't stop things happening. We can only advocate and lobby for things to be either protected, given form of protect, protection in terms of heritage listing. Um, we can't actually stop people from demolishing things, but so we, we operate as a lobbying force, really, rather than a, a regulatory force. It's all about cost, I understand that, but you remember, remember a few years ago we had the... Uh, Building in uh, Victoria Square that was lifted up. Yes, that's right. The Marine Harbours building. Yeah, yes, that yeah. That was a good example of. <coughs> yeah, that. that's exactly right. And all of a sudden, the GPO there that's closing yes. up and we've got the block next door to the GPO. Yes. It was an old building. Which was an old hotel. Yeah. 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 And they wanted that filled in with old GPO styling. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, it's one of the new guys that pull to sort of well, we, we, look, we don't have pull, but what, what we can do, what we've done for a couple of things like at Fort Largs, you know, you know about Fort Largs Taparoo, we got some of the other buildings there listed so that they actually have heritage protection now. Insofar as heritage protection is, is imperfect, there are ways to get around heritage protection, but we've been lobbying and making sure that these places get heritage listing at least which gives them some kind of protection. But uh, yeah, that, that was an unfortunate case with the hotel that got pulled down. There's a whole backstory around that. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so, but you know, in some cases, you know, maybe what they're going to do in the old post office is going to be good. You know, you, you don't always know that the outcome's going to be a bad thing. Um, yeah, I think, or apartments or something. Um, but you know, Electra House, you can say, okay, well maybe they should have, you know, kept it more, in a heritage style, but it's pretty good what they've done, and it's better than having a, a, an empty building for 20 years. So, you know, there's this. They're building up the, uh, you know, the this marriage building now. Yeah. And that now is starting to really be needed. Yeah, that, that's right. So, you know, it's good to see investment in these buildings because they, they need they need activity to keep them alive. Yeah. One, uh, yes, Tony. How hard would it be to 
include Shia blogging Bola on the wiki. Would that be all of the machines? People have got masters at that. This new ball. They're actually all, they've all been photographed and they're on farming around Gawler. The whole lot of them. It's about 72. On farming around Gawler. It's on the website down under What's Hot. Okay. Yep, the whole lot of them. Yeah. One question, Darren. Um, who is responsible for giving a building heritage listing? Well, that, that, that's a thing that's either done. <coughs> That's um, question, question. either done at the state level, if it's going for state heritage listing, there's the Heritage Branch and Heritage Council, which is a government body, which um, approves heritage nominations. So, say at Fort Largs, we put in a nomination in for two buildings there and made the argument why they should have state heritage oh. listing. The Heritage Council considers that. Um, and then there's a three-month kind of period where people can object to the nomination, and then if that gets through that, then they approve it. Local heritage listing is quite different and it actually varies between councils and one of the things that's really going to be important for us the next year is the new planning legislation which is trying to, if you like, rationalise um, local heritage listings. So that is probably code for reducing local heritage listing. So you've got a quite an extensive local heritage list in Gawler, um, but what the government wants to do is try and merge all the heritage lists into one and to do an audit, which always makes you think that's probably about cutting something. Um, so one of the things, we're, we're kind of getting ready for that in terms of looking at how do we make sure that all of the local heritage listed places have the best documentation they can. And that's why Paul's work is so brilliant, because you are the only local council area in the state that has an encyclopedic <coughs> photographic collection of your local heritage places, thanks to Paul. Yeah. So I think yeah. bravo to Paul. I would be holding that up as a model to other communities to say, if you want to protect your local heritage, make sure you document it, make sure you, you do the research on it, and you get it public, because then it's going to be harder for them to remove those, those okay. things. If you live in a heritage house, yep. uh, and you change it, you're likely to prosecution, are you? Um, no, there's a lot of myths about that, actually. Um, look, there are certain rules around what you can do to a heritage listed structure, and it varies depending on whether it's a um, local listing or a state listing. Um, and people sometimes think that have a, having a house heritage listed diminishes its value or makes it hard to sell. But actually, we know we know from from um, a lot of research that a place being heritage listed generally adds about 10% to its value. So heritage listing is nothing to be scared of. Although, in like in Adelaide, for example, they have a process whereby if the council nominates your building for heritage listing, you can object, and so owners can object to a heritage listing and prevent it happening. So. It, there's been a lot of debate for you know 30 years in North Adelaide about this kind of stuff and um, about people having their houses um, listed but then, reject, uh, then objecting to it. And what we found is that most places where the owner objected to the listing have now been demolished. So if if, if an owner resists a heritage listing, it's probably going to get demolished. Paul's got one final question. Um, just a curious point in in Victoria, in Melbourne, I've saved their old buildings, the facades, and I've built massive buildings inside them. Do you see that future for Adelaide with such a, with a yeah. tremendous amount of... Look, it's, it's interesting, that, that kind of facadism, as they call it, was very big in the 80s and 90s, and we've got some quite quite significant examples of it in Adelaide. Along Grenfell Street, you can see a few. The old mail exchange there has got a big tower behind it as well. And so that was what people thought was a good solution in the 80s and 90s. Just keep the front and, you know, put a tower behind. And there was quite a lot of discussion about, you know, what's an appropriate setback for a tower so it doesn't, you know, overshadow the old facade. But I think we've moved on from that a bit. And, and we try to really preserve the whole fabric of the building. And, uh, you know, actually this idea now of adaptive reuse where you try to keep the original structure as much as you can, but you reuse it um, without just knocking it down and keeping the facade. So I think of Gawler Chambers as the perfect example in Adelaide of inactivity for far too long. It is, and that's a great case where uh, the owner of that building doesn't want to spend a cent. And so the government's oh. getting very annoyed with them and actually thinking about, and the council's thinking about ways to penalise them. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it, um, because that building's been just allowed to deteriorate. Yeah. Okay.